Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Stuart Halloway, and uh, welcome to this uh, special session of Triclosure. Uh, we're going to be talking about datomic ions. This presentation is going to be in four parts. Uh, the first part is going to be uh, the why questions. Why, why is why datomic ions? What are they useful for? What are the you know, tensions and trade-offs in their design? Uh, the second part is going to be mapping that directly onto code and saying, OK, there's a bunch of uh, omnigraphles. And then you know, how do we actually you know, turn that into actual code? So uh, the second part will make this more concrete. Uh, the third part, the exciting part, is doing that all with live coding. So running all the bits and seeing all the pieces work together. Uh, then we will break from here. And those who want to will move to uh, some comfortable location in downtown Durham, which apparently has many such comfortable locations these days. And we'll have a drink and continue the conversation. So that's the sort of layout. Let's get started. So there's a problem if you are a closure and datomic developer. And so datomic has been out for six years now, I believe. And uh, when we originally launched Atomic, we intended it to run primarily on AWS. And we quickly discovered, talking to users, that the users aspired to run on AWS, but they weren't necessarily going to run on AWS uh, immediately. So a lot of Datomic work over the first several years was in helping users run in a variety of on-premise, you know, in more traditional environments. Uh, one of the challenges that those users faced was it's a sort of daunting array of things you need to decide if you're going to run software uh, on the AWS cloud. And this picture gives you some idea of the things you would get into. It's like, OK, I just have a program. Right? I'm a programmer. I like to write apps. That's what I do. But now I have to think about, well, where is my app going to store things? It used to be that was a given. right? There was, you know, It was going to be a SQL database. Now, but now it's like it could be DynamoDB, or it could be S3, or it could be Simple DB. I mean, there are a half dozen choices uh, on AWS alone, and they're more different than you know vanilla SQL from Strawberry SQL from Chocolate SQL. Uh, and there's going to be a technology for everything that used to be done in a sort of monolithic way in data centers. There's going to be these broken out pieces that do things. So there's a great story for security, right? There's uh, identity and access management. I am. There is uh, private VPC support. There is uh, AWS key management, KMS, uh, you know, encryption at rest, rotating keys, all of that. There's IAM roles and IAM groups and yada, yada, yada. So it's a lot of moving parts. And basically, uh, you know, in the, the first several years of Datomic, people who were enthusiastic about AWS you know, waded in and figured all these things out and did really cool things. And people who <laughs> had other pressures and didn't have the time to do that uh, were left out a little bit. So uh, fast forward to November 2017. I can do date math. Uh, uh, we released Datomic Cloud. And the idea of Datomic Cloud is to say, um, let's make running on AWS a lot easier while preserving and maybe even enforcing uh, sound architectural decisions. So Datomic Cloud knows about all these pieces. When you're running Datomic Cloud, you're automatically inside of an auto-scaling group. When you're running Datomic Cloud, you're automatically behind a network load balancer. There's a Route 53 entry created for that network load balancer. Uh, Datomic knows which data stores to talk to and when. So it uses DynamoDB as the primary log. Uh, it uses S3 as the primary index store. It uses EFS to have a scalable lower latency store. And it uses SSDs to have a non-scalable but super low latency store that's on individual instances. And all those things uh, are done for you automatically. Um, everywhere that AWS has a solution for a problem that a database might face, Datomic tries to use that AWS solution. So do you want to secure a Datomic database? You're going to use IAM. Um, is everything going to be encrypted? Absolutely. How are the keys going to be managed? KMS, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so this is really a huge step for making it possible to jump right into the cloud and say, you know what, I want to develop an app. And you know, maybe I'll learn about all these pieces you know, as I need to, but I want to just get started and be able to build you know, a basic application uh, quite quickly. And this is delivered through what's called the AWS Marketplace. So the Marketplace is a place within AWS's site where you go and say, I want to use Datomic, and you click on a checkbox. And then the Datomic usage is just rolled into your AWS bill as a line item. 
So this makes it very easy for people who want to you know, try it out. It also makes it very low cost. Right? So you can run it for five hours, try your experiment, and be like, OK, that was interesting, and turn it off until you decide that you want to use it uh, in a heavier weight way. So this is great. Problem solved. Right? Mission accomplished. I wish I had that George Bush you know, face. Mission accomplished. We solved this problem. But now there's another problem. Right? You're writing closure applications. And everything I said about what a datomic might want in AWS are going to be questions you're going to want to answer for your app tier as well. Right? You're going to want to say, hey, how do I integrate with AWS security? How do I integrate with AWS networking? How do I stay available? How do I auto scale? So we put all this work into answering these questions once. And we ship this thing. And then to use it, you immediately are faced with all those questions again when you go and do the app tier. Well, now this picture has uh, what I would call a very advanced use of foreshadowing. Um, there's a little dotted circle inside of Datomic Cloud that is exactly the same size and shape as the Clojure logo. So the idea behind Datomic Ions is as simple as that. Let's take all the work that was put into making a place for Datomic to run and let that also be a place for Clojure programs to run. Right, so that's it. You can write with ions. You can write closure code and then have all of those AWS pieces enlisted in an automated fashion on your behalf um, inside of Datomic's auto scaling group, inside of Datomic's cloud formation. So it becomes a, a deployment target for closure applications. Great. So, awesome. yeah, cool. All right. Now, I'm going to try to run this in the style of a late 70s, late night TV infomercial. So you are probably asking yourself right now, OK, fine, Stu, that sounds cool. But I bet I have to do really weird shit in my app to make that work, don't I? I bet I have to like adopt some style of programming or some crazy framework that's going to you know, completely change the way I work. I say, no. <laughs> you do not have to do those things. So the idea here is that you're going to write programs the way you write programs. And in particular, we're closure programmers. We're going to concentrate on having fun and writing funds. Right? So I want to sit at the closure REPL and create functions. And as I'm creating my functions, I'm going to need other code to help me out. And uh, since the most recent release of Clojure, there's a really amazing library in the Clojure ecosystem called tools.deps. What tools.deps does is it allows you to talk about your dependencies in Maven speak, or in Git speak, or in file system speak. So you can say, I need this library, and it's over here in Maven. Or you can say, I need this library, and it's over here in Git. Or you can say, and this is an important case, I am co-developing three libraries that interoperate with each other. I do not want to use an artifactual version of any of those libraries right now, because I'm making changes to them in tandem. So I'm going to say in my project, these three libraries are currently located on the file system in sibling directories or whatever you know, floats your boat. So that is the workflow I have as a Clojure developer. I mean, forgetting about Datomic and Cloud and AWS. From, this is how I work in Clojure every day, regardless of what I'm doing. Right, I sit down. I have a problem. I think about what the solution should be. And everybody knows that I don't just jump in and start typing, that I go and lie down in a hammock for an appropriate length of time first. But after I've done that, uh, I then go and say, start coding, uh, pull together some depths. And the thing that IONS ask of you on top of this process is that you do this one little additional thing, which is write a configuration file that says, I would like the following functions to be exposed as IONS. So you know, I've written uh, a library that has 45 functions in it. Seven of them are top level functions. So those seven functions are going to be ions, and they're going to be exposed to the world in some way. And that's the only thing. And it's literally a list. right? It's in an Eden map under the key allow. And there's a list that says these seven things are now going to be exposed as ions. That's the development process. Not different from what you're doing now, with the exception of making this one file. Now, the next thing you want to do is you say, OK, I've been working on my application for a while, and I want to create a release. And in Amazon speak, um, this is called a push. And that terminology 
comes from Amazon's code deploy, which is Amazon's technology that uh, can automatically cycle new code onto running EC2 instances. How many people here use AWS regularly now? Right? How many people cycle EC2 instances to make changes? Right? When you cycle an EC2 instance to make a change, you have to wait for instant cycle time. So one of the things that Code Deploy aspires to do is to say, what well, you can make changes, certain kinds of changes anyway, on an, on an instance without cycling the instance. You're just going to cycle processes. So the push operation uh, in Datomic Ions says, I have a moment in time that I'm going to say, this is a release. And that moment can have a strong name. If it has a strong name, that's a git sha. Right? So it's a commit that I just made that ties together all the pieces. Strong name is a good. And it's a SHA. Yeah, it's a secure hash algorithm SHA. Okay. Right? It, is, it, is, it is a content address over the thing. So you could go back and validate that another thing that claimed to be the same thing was not. Is, is or is not the thing. Right? Strong name, stronger than just a randomly assigned GUID. Okay. Right? This, is, this is gets content addressing. Uh, so this is a strong, reproducible name. Um, or if you're doing interactive development, you could say, you know what? I don't care about that. I just want to say, I'm going to call this Stu's harebrained experience, uh, experiment. So either way is fine. But in either case, when you push, you're going to have a name, whether it's an assigned strong name or a name I made up um, because I'm doing development. And when you issue a push, uh, IONS are going to take your dependencies and they are going to uh, install them in S3 uh, in a bucket in your account. And they're going to install them with all the knowledge of tools depths intact. So all the granularity that Tools Depths has about knowing your dependencies and knowing about Maven and knowing about Git, all that survives this transition. So it's not what's the opposite of this, right? Uber jarring, that sort of thing, like making a, a monolithic thing. Um, this thing is installed uh, in its pieces in S3. In addition, push creates an identity in the code deploy system. So that's an AWS thing. That identity is called a revision which is what they call a release. Right? This is a specific piece of code. Now, at this point, we have not actually run the code anywhere. We have just said we have made a release that we could run somewhere. Or, and this is important, we could run it multiple wares. So that's push. The next step is deploy. Deploy says, let's take a revision from code deploy and uh, deploy that to a running Datomic compute group. So when you're running Datomic Cloud, you have one or more compute groups that represent a system. And so here, you can target uh, a particular one of those groups and install code onto it. So there are, there's one and a half things that happen when you do a deploy. The one thing that happens, and this is for sure, is deploy creates what Amazon Code Deploy calls a deployment. And a, a deployment associates a what with a where. The what is the release that you just made, the push revision in their terminology. And the where is which group you want to run it on. Where did those groups come from? The groups are managed automatically for you. They're created for you when you created the Datomic Cloud system. So when you create the Datomic Cloud system, it automatically has a group sitting there waiting so that you can install code. Then on every Datomic node, there is a piece of code running called the Code Deploy Agent. And what the code deploy agent does is it gets notified um, by code deploy, hey, there's new code to be run. And there's a protocol that it follows. And uh, in our extension of that protocol, rather than downloading a monolithic thing, which is typically the way code deploy is used, um, it downloads only the bits that have changed. So if you've done this 10 times and you've got 75 libraries and you just made a, you know, a one line change to your source code, it's downloading that one line change to your source code, not the 75 libraries. It knows about that difference. And the objective here is to make this fast. In particular, the objective is to make it fast enough that you would use it for interactive development. You would be like, I tried it at the REPL. I think it's good. Push deploy. Now I want to see it running in the cloud and think it's good there and be able to see uh, the changes uh, take place immediately. Uh, uh, all of those, you know, the, the part about this that's datomic specialness is the tools.depths granularity of things. But a lot of the coolness here is code deploy. So if you haven't looked at AWS code deploy before, it's cool. And code deploy does things like um, ensures a rolling deployment. So if you have a two or n node system where n is not the number one, um, then these deploys maintain availability throughout. Right? It will drop one node out from underneath the load balancer deploy the code there, 
do a health check on the box, make sure it's happy, and then put that one back on the load balancer, and then it will do the next one. And code deploy handles uh, rolling back if something goes wrong, and so on. So that's the thing that happens, the one thing. The other thing that happens is a maybe thing. When you created that configuration file, in addition to saying these seven things are ions, you could also have said, and by the way, four of them are lambdas. I want them to be invocable via AWS lambdas. And I guess to match the picture here, let's say I say three of them are lambdas. Right? So three of the functions in my system are actually um, going to be accessed via AWS lambdas. Then when you do this deploy, the deploy also automatically ensures that those lambdas are configured as you requested in the configuration file. Um, there's very little configuration to do, but there are a couple of, of knobs that you can pull uh, in certain circumstances. And so this operation, and we use this word a lot uh, internally on the Datomic team, is this is an ensure operation. A lot of AWS operations are things like create or update. And they don't necessarily have great semantics when you want to say, I would like to guarantee that this thing exists and has these properties. Um, and so sometimes you have to do a little bit of work, you know, fiddle with AWS APIs and say, query, do I see if it exists? If it does exist, update it. If it doesn't exist, create it, all that stuff. The, the semantic operation here, um, it says creates on the side, but it really ensures that these lambdas exist and are correctly configured. So Stuart? Yes. Um, if there's, if there's a, a SHA hash on the entire, um, what, what, you put, what you push. Yes. Does it then go back through, does, does a process of deploy go through and say what's, what's changed or were there individual uh, hashes on the individual, each dep, each fun, and, and, each conf and the config all have separate um, hashes? So the question is, does, is there a top level hash or is there multiple sub hashes? This is, there is a top level hash. One of the things that we want to do here is allow you to think in terms of an application. One of the difficulties in using Lambda is logically a lot of people want to deploy an application that consists of these five lambdas. But it's on you or on some automation tool to pull those five things together. So that SHA hash covers the configuration that manages all five of those lambdas. So if one of those lambdas was configured differently, the SHA hash would change. And then we would see that as a deploy that needed to be dealt with. And then it does a diff at e on each lambda it to say, do it, it, it does does absolutely does okay. a diff. It doesn't need a SHA. It's going to do a diff okay. and say, do I actually C. Yeah, you could think of that. It's really implementation detail at some point. But the ensure operation is, if this lambda says, I want to be configured for lambda invoke, and you changed it, and I say, I want to configure it as a web service, which is one of the knobs that you have, um, then it would say, oh, that's not the, the right lambda anymore. And it would fix it and do whatever's necessary. And uh, all the magic about this, the actual code behind, is, is work that Chris Redinger, who's sitting in the back of the room, uh, did all this work. And it's super amazing and cool, all the stuff that he can make uh, AWS do. But that, you know, so I'm also sort of pushing you at him with all the hard questions uh, <laughs> when we get to the bar later. I was just thinking that depending upon the, comple the complexity and size of some of the, some of the items, if, if you buy anything from a performance perspective just to do a, a hash comparison uh, rather than just do it you know, item by item. So uh, I would say categorically that this is the first release of IONS. We released IONS a week ago. And so um, there are 100 million optimizations that we might make. And we will make them as they emerge and are sensible. I would be astonished if that one was in the top 50, based on what I've seen so far. Um, there are definitely places to do interesting and cool optimizations. And, and I could be wrong, right? That's why we use it and you know, find out, use it, test it, all that. All right, so that's deploy. So now you have written some code. And you have pushed and deployed an application. Uh, the next thing you do is configure the application. So in this step, is only if you've chosen to expose lambdas. So if you've chosen to expose lambdas, uh, lambdas are AWS's connective tissue. Right? They, have, they have really committed hard to lambdas as how things are going to fit together. And so there are a couple of really interesting integration points with lambda. One of them is AWS services emit events that you can then register a lambda to handle. So somebody changes a file in S3. That makes an event. A Kinesis stream gets processed somewhere. That makes an event. And there are dozens of these. In fact, when I look at the UI, it seems like there's more things in the UI than are even in the docs um, in terms of events. But this is a fast growing area in AWS. And essentially, this is anything that's happening in AWS, they want to be able to tell you about it via a Lambda. 
So in this step, this has nothing to do with ions anymore. Right? At this point, ions are a black box. What's your point of contact with the world? Lambdas. AWS lambdas. So somebody comes along, and you know your job was, I want you to make an event handler that fires when um, something happens in S3. You present that to somebody as a lambda and say, here's the payload. Well, actually, the payload, in this case, all those AWS services dictate the payload. Right? They're documented typically by JSON examples. Um, and if you've ever done it before, the, you can, the sample JSON is in the console UI as you turn on an integration. So you say, I want to do this integration, and it immediately pops up and says, well, here's the JSON you're going to get uh, you know, when you do this integration. The other integration, and this is uh, at least as interesting, if not more so, is API Gateway allows you to put web services on the internet, and it handles a lot of the tricksy operational bits. Uh, flow control, um, developer access tokens, rate limiting, uh, protecting you from uh, you know, certain kinds of attacks, all that sort of business. Uh, and APA Gateway allows you to forward web traffic to a Lambda. So you can configure via API Gateway to say, when web requests come to this API Gateway, answer them by running the code in this Lambda. Now, I should emphasize here that these Lambdas are for connectivity and not for computation. And Lambdas. Uh, have a mixed reputation for computation. Um, you have to manage how big they are and how many resources you give them. And when you turn the knob on memory, it also turns the knob on CPU. There's not separate knobs. So there's a lot of uh, you know, little bits about managing lambdas. That doesn't happen here. These lambdas are entirely generic. They're shims. The actual code is running inside the datomic cluster. So the lambdas are being used as connective tissue. They are not being used uh, to actually do work. And in fact, those of you who have a programming language background, as soon as we hit this uh, point in the design conversation, I said to Rich, I never am allowed to name anything on this team. Right? Rich is really good at naming things. Um, and he also thinks he's really good at naming things. When you combine those two things, it really creates a lot of uh, pressure in favor of him naming things. Uh, but I said, if we're going to make one lambda that gets copied millions of times and configured as a proxy, I want it to be called ultimate comma the lambda. So, so, so this lambda is actually called ultimate comma the lambda. And you never see it. I mean, you can look at it if you want. But ultimate comma the lambda gets instantiated however many times you've asked. And it's just parameterized to say how it's going to call through uh, into Datomic Cloud. OK. Now it's all over except for the using it. So now you have code running in the cluster node that you wrote. and. Uh, I should emphasize here, and for some people, this is how this story began. Um, one way that you can use IONS is that now your queries and transactions can call functions that you wrote. This was the biggest single requested feature when we shipped cloud back in November. Everybody who had experience using the peer model said, I want to be able to write my own code and have it run inside of a transaction. Or I want to be able to write my own code and have it run inside of a query. Well, now you can do that. And in some ways, I think in several ways, actually, it's better. Because in uh, Datomic on-prem, in order to have a transaction function, you have to install it in the database. Now it's just installed on the class path. It's an ordinary closure var that you wrote and tested locally, and then uh, installed it, and then call it inside the node. So, and these things are whitelisted, by the way. So this is another difference uh, from on-prem for people who are coming from there. These functions have to be in that allow list. So you may have shipped 500 functions and install them there. But you list as a whitelist. These are the ones that are allowed to be called inside of a transaction. So that somebody cannot you know, just make your system call you know, system exit or something like that. Um, you get to choose which things are called. So that's in your control. So that's inside. And then on the outside, you can uh, interact with the system through these lambdas. So lambda has its own invoke API. So if you're writing data-driven services on AWS, then the go-to technique for that in the AWS world is to make a lambda. Um, now, in this world, the go-to technique is to have a Lambda that uh, calls into Datomic Cloud, and then you can just invoke that directly. If you have configured those services I talked about before, if you said, you know, whenever this Kinesis stream processes a chunk of data, I want to know about it, then those uh, events, AWS will call your Lambdas for you. And if you have exposed a web service or web services via the API gateway, then uh, when somebody hits that web endpoint, then uh, that will be passed. You know, the API gateway will call the Lambda. The Lambda will call the Atomic Cloud. Now, other than maybe the implementation complexities around working with Lambdas, the real advantage here is you're back to, and I don't want to call it the peer model anymore, because that word has associations for people, but it's the model where 
your API access to Datomic is at memory speed, right? These things have in memory, in JVM, cache segments, log, all the, all the bits of Datomic. So you can write your programs to not care about how far away things are because things are always cuddling up right next to you, right? So you can access, you can perform queries. Now it's through the client API. So it, it looks, it's an API that looks like it could be remote, but it isn't. Right? So when you call query, it's happening right there. When you call transact, it's happening right there uh, on, in the process. So that's Datomic Ions. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and that's the end of part one. Right? Datomic Ions allow you to, to deploy your application inside of a Datomic Cloud cluster. Now, I should mention, by the way, that nothing about this compels you to use Datomic in this way. Right? You can continue to use Datomic by calling it via the client API. Um, and you can, in every single one of these pieces is opt-in. You could use IONS just to install transaction functions. So, so these things aren't happening by themselves. You'd have to say, I want to use Dynamic DB or... Well, these, the use of these services is happening. So it's a good question. What's happening for you? What's happening for you is a very tasteful and well-architected consumption of a bunch of AWS services. What is not happening for you is exposing things through lambdas or transaction functions. You get to decide what code runs. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I, mean, I was just curious. You know, you have a lot of arrows here. When you get that, do you automatically get connectivity to all those pieces, whether, whether you're using them or not? You have connectivity to those. Your process has connectivity to those pieces because that's the granularity of the security model. Yeah. So I you use, could. I use S3. I may use um, some of the the other data store you have. So the, my point is, I it's not providing. Any, there's no special one. API for you to use these things. You would use these things using the normal Amazon APIs, okay. just as if you had written a program yourself. Right. 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 Okay. So, all right. So. Yes, Daniel. I'm still kind of confused about the ions. Like, I understand with the lambdas, you're exposing uh, those to the outside world. But with the ions, you're exposing your functions to, I'm not sure what, like the datomic process or? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you need a, you need a transaction function that enforces, uh, lots of people like to write constructors that enforce uh, val uh, validity constraints on data as it's going into the system. Then you write that constructor as a closure var, test it locally, and then, OK, I'm happy with that. You install that, and now transactions can refer to that function. Instead of saying add and retract, they can say call Daniel's favorite constructor for business you know, validation, whatever. And, and that's your code, right? Which is not different uh, than the, the promise of the on-prem model. The problem we had with the on-prem model is our problem and our user's problem is that we couldn't automate things because everybody's on-prem was different. Right? Everybody's on-prem was using a different storage. Everybody's on-prem was using different virtualization. Um, the thing that's beautiful about AWS is that it narrows the choices. Right? There is an answer for how you're going to do identity. It's IAM. There is an answer for how you're going to do key management. It's KMS. And of course, there are always going to be people who, people who don't want that. There are always going to be people who want the flexibility of saying, you know what? I compile my own kernel every morning you know, before breakfast. And I want to be in complete control of how all the pieces fit together. And on-prem exists, and it's not going anywhere. And new features in the query engine and in the transaction engine are going to be delivered in parallel in on-prem and cloud going forward. So you know, if you are a control freak, run on-prem. If you're a get things done freak, run cloud. All right, that was the end of part one. Part two makes this all concrete um, with this example. So I have been working for the past couple of days on an example to sort of bring this all home. And I forgot to hit um, public on GitHub right before we started the talk, but I will um, right at the end. These will go live. And I have built uh, a little application that actually does a couple of things. It's a Slack bot, so it integrates with Slack. Well, Slack's integration point is web requests. So you're going to see all of this in a minute. We're going to go through all the pieces. But in order to integrate it with Slack, I need to have API Gateway, because I need to actually put an endpoint on the internet that Slack can call and say, blah, 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 something's happened. Um, it also integrates with AWS code deploy events. AWS code deploy events are triggered whenever you deploy code to the system to tell you I'm starting a deploy, I'm ending a deploy. Um, those events, that's published by AWS. The format for those is Lambda invocation. So this service responds to those with a Lambda, right? That says, I'm going to respond to those. And it has 
um, essentially two pieces of functionality. Whenever there's a code deploy, it will um, record that code deploy in a Datomic database so that you can ask questions about the history of code deploys later. And it will say into the Slack channel, hey, there was a code deploy, and here's the information about it. And as you'll see later, the Slack UI represents the outside limit of my ability as a GUI designer, which means that I put it into a code font and used Clojure's print table. But <laughs> Michael Parento and other people wiser than me uh, can, can you know, make a nice UI on this. So not aspiring to that. The second thing it does is that when you talk to the, the Slack bot, his name is deploy status here, now, when you talk to the Slack bot, um, and again, I'm just demonstrating that the integration works, so I didn't do anything fancy with it. So anytime you mention the Slack bot, it burps up the last 10 code deploys into the channel. It doesn't, I mean, obviously, the Slack integration is incredibly rich, and you could spend hours and hours learning it, which I didn't have this week. So I spent minutes and minutes not learning it, and then was able to put this together. And I think, actually, it's kind of a testimony to the workflow, how stupid I am about Slack and how stupid I am about code deploy events, and this still works. And that's a, that is a business advantage. It really is, right? If you can stay dumb about something and make it work, that's a good thing. All right. So the same story we, did, we just talked about, we're going to go through again, this time looking at code. The first part of the game is dev. You write ordinary closure functions. You use the REPL. You use your favorite IDE, which I'm sure is Emacs, but if it isn't, it's probably Cursive or Vim or all those other really nice uh, editor environments. And you use your own testing framework of choice, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's your job, and it hasn't really changed. And it's really the job of IONS to let you focus on this and not worry about anything else. Then you ask IONS to take care of all the mechanics of creating releases and deploying those releases uh, into a running Datomic system. And then you get, on the other side of that, a ton of power. Right? You have the power, again, of in-memory query and transaction access, where you have access to your data. And you get reach. You get the ability to be reached over the web. You get the ability to be reached via lambdas. And you get agility. Right? If used as directed, this is an incredibly <laughs> rapid environment for developing and delivering apps. Right? You, if you use as directed, if you go through this workflow, if you really, and it really has, it really has to do with already having drunk the work at the REPL Kool-Aid. Right? If you already drank that Kool-Aid, you're good. All right, so let's look. First step is dev. And in dev, we are going to write some functions. And apologies for the font being a little bit difficult to see. Um, actually, I wonder if I can fix that real quick. I'm going to fix that, or at least try to bold it. Can you guys read it in the back? I can read it. All right, all right. That's why I up front. So um, this is an event handler that responds to code deploy events. So uh, an event handler just receives two keys, an input and a context. Where did those names come from? That's what happens when you implement a Lambda. So this is a direct translation of AWS's spec for what Lambdas look like into a handler that can sit behind a Lambda. So that input is going to have um, JSON in it, and uh, we are going to call a helper function, event to transaction. Event to transaction reads the JSON and converts it to transaction data, and then add refs, um, patches up all the unique identity refs. Uh, then we're going to figure out what Slack channel we're supposed to be talking to, which we're going to get some configuration for our Slack channel. Then we're going to transact the data into the database and call post Slack message to the Slack channel, and we're going to print out the data as a code block. Because like I said, that was the fanciest formatting I could come up with. I'm sure you can make it brightly colored or have little happy icons or something if you knew how. I didn't. Um, so that's what this is the, what you write. And you write and test this thing at the REPL with data. Right? There's no I.O. going on. And we'll see that later as well. Here's the one for the web server. So this is the thing that gets called by um, the Slack integration. So this is a web request. And so the keys on this request, how many people have implemented a ring application of any kind. Right? The keys are ring-like. Um, there are a couple of keys in ring that are deprecated, so we don't use those. Um, <clears throat> and there are a couple of keys in ring that are extremely rarely used and are actually a misfit. But by and large, you're going to have headers, body, um, server, um, whether it's HTTP or HTTPS, whether it's get or post. And in my case, I don't care about any of that. I only care about the body contents. So this says, 
I know that Slack's integration is going to send me JSON, so I'm going to use Closure's JSON read to read that out. And again, I'm going to look up the Slack channel. Now, when Slack calls you, it puts a header called the verification token. Um, and actually, sometimes it's a header, sometimes it's in the JSON. In this case, um, it's in the JSON. So we're going to look in the JSON and see if the token in the JSON matches the token that we configure for the application, which I did offline so I didn't have to show you the token. Right? So I, I connected to the database from my REPL on my laptop before I started running this in a deployed state, and I installed the Slack configuration, which included the name of the Slack channel and this verification token. We're going to check the verification token, and then we really have three pieces of functionality. Um, if we're verified, then there's only two kinds of messages that Slack will send us, a challenge or an actual integration message. The challenge will have uh, the key challenge in it, and that's how Slack makes sure that you're actually a real endpoint before it even will integrate with you. So when you go into Slack and say, I want to talk to this, it says, well, give me your URL, and then I'm going to send it a challenge. Um, if you respond, so that's, that first part is respond with a status 200 and return the challenge as the body. That's how you respond to the Slack challenge. The second one is, uh, and again, mine is not looking at the arguments at all. Right? If I get called from Slack for any reason, I'm going to dump the most recent deploys into the Slack channel. So whatever Slack says, I don't really care. Talk to the hand. I think you probably asked for the most recent 10 deploys, because that's what you're going to get. Um, and then, if we're not verified, you're supposed to return an error. They don't document in the Slack API what error you're supposed to return. I picked 503 as uh, a reasonable one. Right? So this is a web service. This is a complete web service. And where I say keys, header, body, this could be a ring like you know, route table. It could be the whole, the whole deal. This one's not that uh, elaborate, but it could be. Then you need to declare some dependencies. So let's look through these briefly. The Datomic Ion tools, so com.datomic ion, um, the, the ion tools have a very small number of useful functions. Um, you may never use them, but I'll give you an example of one of these functions. Um, the Lambda gateway specifies, uh, the API gateway specifies a JSON payload that is their data format of a web request. You are closure programmers, you're used to the ring format of a web, uh, web request. So the ion library has a function in it called ionize in a namespace called API gateway that if you call it on a ring handler, it will turn it into an API gateway handler. So that's the one line of code you have to add to an existing ring style handler uh, to make it invocable in this way. Uh, Data.json and closure obvious. Um, client cloud, this is a little bit interesting. So I don't have a dependency on the client library in my depths at all. Because when I deploy this into the cloud, it already has the client library. I, I could say it, but I don't need to. Right? It has a local implementation, a local in-memory implementation of the client library. I don't need to say that. I could if I wanted to, but I don't need to. I have client cloud as a dev dependency because I want to call locally to my running system while I'm developing. And when we do the interactive workflow in part three of this talk, you'll see me using this. I will create a client. I'll connect to the cloud and use that as my, I mean, my entire dev workflow is on my local laptop using the client. And then the ion dev tools implement the push and deploy commands. So those commands that I talked about that ions are going to do the work for you, those are implemented in that library. So idiomatically, you're going to see a depths.eden have these two extra depths, client cloud and ion dev in a typical ion project. And then this is the configuration file. This is the whole thing. It has currently three sections. The allow section is the list of functions which are ions. In this case, the event handler, I named it first before I knew I was going to do two things. It's not a great name anymore. That's actually the AWS um, code deploy event handler, and Slack event handler handles the Slack events. The lambdas describe how we want to expose them as lambdas, and the only thing I've twiddled here, well, the lambdas allow you to name the lambdas. So the keyword in the lambda map is what name the AWS user is going to see for the lambdas. So I've named them event handler and Slack event handler. And then these keys, there can be other keys in here. Chris, what are, the, what are some of the other things you can say in here? Timeout, uh, concurrency. Yeah, timeout, concurrency, other Lambda settings you could put on here. And then there's this integration. And that is something that you have to say if you're doing the API gateway thing. So if you're intending your Lambda to be an API gateway proxy, um, the tr request needs to be transformed. And so that's what that integration key that appears there. It doesn't appear in the event handler. And then the app name is the name of the group where you want to deploy uh, code to. And is that right, Chris? I can never keep these words straight. The name of the 
It's the name of the code deploy application, and then you can deploy that to multiple groups. Right? So this is where you, this is where you push to. Applications you push to, I can, you can get totally lost in the thicket of code deploy words. So this is, an application could be a group of systems. So you could have, for example, um, dev, CI, demo, and production all with the same application, which would facilitate running the application for a while in demo or CI before you push the button to say, I now also want to run the application somewhere else. And if you go back to the terminology I was using before, um, push creates a release, deploy executes it somewhere. So you could say push, make this awesome release we have, and then you could say deploy to staging. And we'll just chill out on staging for a while and make sure we're happy. And deploy to demo, and then if you're super thrilled with it, you could say deploy uh, to production or whatever. I mean, it's up to you how you want to use it, but that's an, a kind of an odd, obvious idiomatic example. All right, so now there's push and deploy. Push and deploy take up a lot of space in the picture, talking about all the moving parts and all the things that happen, but ions are doing the work for you, so there's really not much for you to do. Push, you invoke the ion dev tools, and you push, and I had to specify a U name here because I didn't have a strong name. I wasn't working from a git commit, so U stands for unreproducible name. And this will be labeled in various places in the AWS infrastructure as Stu deployed this application unreproducibly, which means that if it's not working, you can call me or page me or yell at me. Um, this is not how you go to production. Right? If you're going to production, you don't have to specify that, and this command will actually return the name that you're going to use. And then deploy says, I want to take this thing that I pushed, notice the U name is the same, and then pick which compute resource. Mine is named Stu8 Compute. Um, because it's the compute group of the eighth system I made in this particular account. <laughs> Not for any particular reason. Uh, but this could be, for example, this group could be um, staging or production or whatever. You could use it however you wanted to. But there's not very much for you to do here. You run these two commands. And uh, on a small system, uh, this takes um, under 30 seconds to do both. So this is something that you, would do, you could do interactively while you're developing. Um, it takes a slightly longer to do deploys the more machines you have in the cluster because it will wait for each machine to cycle before it tells you that it's good. Um, but if you have a small cluster, like you know, staging or whatever, then it's, this is really fast. Now, I'm ready to configure this. So I went into CloudWatch and I said I want to make a rule that when a code deploy has a state change, I want to call my Lambda. So this is all, I'm not doing datomic stuff anymore. So we don't have to really, you know, get overwhelmingly into the woods on this, but this is, um, I want to cause a, an event that happens in AWS to fire. Likewise, with API Gateway, I go into API Gateway and I say that I want my request to handle the entire URL, I want it to be a Lambda function that's a proxy, and I want to point it at my Lambda. Do you give that Lambda function a name or is it just like string concatenate something? So it is the, so, oh, okay. So one of the problems with um, Lambda is it doesn't really have namespaces, and it has what, a 64 character limit on names, and that's a global limit in your account. So what we are doing right now is it's named after your group followed by your, um, or named after, actually named after your stack. It's named after your compute stack followed by this, the name you picked. Um, we will, uh, in all likelihood, add knobs around Lambda naming. Um, although I hope that before we get to it, that AWS will add <laughs> knobs on, around it on their side or, or more capabilities. Because it's really, it's really a challenge for people when you're, and, and uh, in fact, people end up making tear off accounts, right? As in, you know, AWS accounts has namespaces in some cases in order to sort of deal with this kind of thing. Um, but yeah, these are, these are just names. So it's the name of my stack followed by the name that I specified in my config file. And then this is me invoking a Lambda from the test console. Um, and these JSON payloads, I copied out of the console. So I went into the console and said, hey, I'm interested in code deploy events. And it said, here's what they all look like. And then they made it really tricky to select it and copy and paste it. But after like 20 seconds of fiddling, I was able to drag the mouse down on the inside of it and not select the whole page, which is what it wanted to do. But then once I did that, I just pasted this out and pasted it in here. So I was able to test this uh, and, and see it work. Um, Likewise, I was able to test the API gateway just by invoking it through Slack. So I just walk up and say, hello, deploy status, uh, and it give me, you know, give me back deploy statuses. So now you've learned everything about IONS twice. The first go around was the why. Why are we doing this? 
We have a great place to run Datomic on AWS, and now we want to let that be a great place to run your closure code as well, and the steps that go into making that work. And now we've gone through it in code, uh, looking at a real example. Um, the next step is to look at the local dev story. So I'm going to show you, talk about this for a second, and then we're going to go out and actually do some local dev. So there's a new server type in the config map for cloud. Uh, you can have server type peer server if you're using the client on-prem. You can have server type cloud if you're using a client with Datomic Cloud. But you can also have server type ion. When you say your server type ion, this says choose a client or in-memory implementation by context. In other words, if this code finds itself running on a cluster node, it's like, woohoo, I'm in memory. I'll use the local client. But if it finds itself running on your laptop, it'll say, aw, darns it. I am not in memory, but I can still talk because I have all these other keys that tell me how to do that. And this is a thing that facilitates local dev. Because you use this one map, you get it working by deving locally, <clears throat> and then when you're happy, you deploy the code and it just works because it, hey, not only does it just work, it runs faster because it's got in memory access to the pieces. And you're talking to a solo, atomic solo? You can be talking to, so um, Jacob's question is, am I talking to a solo system here? In this case, um, actually, I had a bug in my demo earlier today, and so I actually flip-flopped my system from solo to production and back to solo again um, by downing the templates. Um, not, don't try this at home. Um, and so I, it happens, I happen to have done this on both today, but that's unusual. That, that doesn't matter. Were you thinking that it would matter for some reason? No. I Mm. So everything about, so, so Datomic Cloud comes in two footprints today, solo and production. Now the solo footprint is deliver the semantics of Datomic in the smallest cost footprint we can figure out how to make. And so it runs on a, what, T2 small, and it runs only a single instance. And I mean, we, we are pairing everything. So like we're pulling out metrics from the dashboard to make the dashboard cheaper and things like that. So, so it, is, it is the smallest footprint you know, we think you can have a reasonable experience in. And it's suitable for tire kicking and departmental apps and hobby apps and that sort of thing. And then production um, is the whole thing on steroids. It guarantees high availability. It has the load balancer. But the semantics are all the same. And how can I tell which kind of system I'm running on by looking at this? You can't. So I could swap. I mean, that's kind of the point, right? I could swap out um, behind this, and you wouldn't have to know. All right, so now we are going to switch to part three, where we actually code this. So I'm going to look. I have a REPL already ready. So I developed this application entirely interactively at the REPL, and I pulled out the highlights of that development, which is to say, not all the mistakes. Uh, to show them here. But all the mistakes were, were categorically the kinds of mistakes. Maybe we'll even make a few mistakes on purpose just so we can see what happens. In fact, I will do that. I'm going to make a mistake on purpose. Uh, I might get to do this for free. So when I'm running locally, uh, Datomic runs in a VPC, in a private VPC. So you cannot connect directly to it. But it provides a Bastion server that you can optionally turn on and tunnel in through the Bastion for development. This console is me running the Bastion server. So I'm going to kill that console because I'm forgetful. And then I'm going to load this namespace. And I'm going to call ev get con. Um, ev is just my event example namespace. And get con just, just calls get connection with that map I showed you a second ago. Right? I've got the map actually embedded in the thing. So I'm going to call get con. And we're going to get unable to connect to system. Connection refused because we're not running the tunnel. So I'll start the tunnel running again. And this is all Sox proxy stuff. It's not interesting to us. Now I will try to connect. <laughs> Sox cloud for Sox proxy. What's that? <laughs> I, I was not trying to be funny. I always hate when that happens. All right. So um, I have stored all the configuration for Slack in the database. This is a sample app. Uh, all normal disclaimers uh, apply. Uh, Amazon has technologies for storing and rotating secrets. And of course, you're going to use those instead of just stuffing them in the database like I did. So that's my channel. 
And these are the kind of tests that I wrote. And these could be automated tests, right? They could be checking return values and so forth. But I just did them exploratorily at the REPL. So I wrote a post Slack message. Stuart? Yes? What is the CB5A, CB5A your secret? Nope, that is not a secret. That is the name of the Slack channel. Gotcha. That's the idea of the Slack channel. Actually, I have no idea. I don't know enough about Slack to know if it's a problem that you now know that. I guess I'll find out later tonight. But it's not, it's not what they describe in their, as their security tokens. right? It's not the security token. All right, so I'm going to post a Slack message. That's going to return an HTTP body that tells me it succeeded. And if we come over here and look, we'll see that the deploy status bot said, hello, everybody. Right? So the thing, the thing I want to emphasize here is I'm not running my code in the cluster node right now. I'm just playing around at the REPL like one does. So now I want to test handling a code deploy event. Well, I also grabbed all those code deploy samples and put them in a directory called fixtures events CD, where CD stands for code deploy. I got tired of typing at that point. Um, and so failure.json is the sample code deploy event. We can actually look at it. It's not very exciting. It's just a big string of JSON. And then we can call the event handler. Again, because we're thinking in closure. Everything is functions that take data and return data. So an event handler just takes an input, which is whatever JSON comes in on the Lambda. I can call that, and it will tell me that it's been handled. And if we go look over here, deploy status will tell me with my lovely text UI that a deployment failed. Wah, wah. Now we can test the query. So I have a query. This, this function. Um, just gives a name to an atomic query. Give me the recent deploys out of the database within the last 24 hours, limiting me to the most recent 10. And so that returns a bunch of data. And notice, by the way, it's, it's not like slow accessing it locally. Right? It's still, I mean, the internet's pretty fast these days. For human users, right? we can totally have a good dev experience, even though we're having to make a client hop to the cluster node to get that answer. Then I have my fancy table formatting. So I'll verify that my printing as a table really prints. And now I want to actually pretend to be Slack. Well, when I'm Slack, my body comes in as an input stream. Why does the body come in as an input stream? Because that's the ring alike way to do it. Um, of course, there are not literals for input streams in Java. So I've got this one little function here, sstream, that lets me take a string and then just wraps it up into an input stream. <laughs> Um, I'm sure there will be a half dozen helper libraries that have functions like this in it shortly. If I, actually, I'm sure there are already helper libraries that have functions like this in it, but I didn't want to depend on anything. So that function just wraps things in a stream. I'm now going to invoke the Slack event handler, passing it an empty JSON map. What is the Slack event handler going to do? We looked at the implementation of it. It says, I'm going to check to see if you have the token. If you do have the token and it matches, I'm going to check to see if you're a challenge. Or if not, I'm going to assume you're a regular request. And if not, I'm going to return a 503. So this should return a 503. And it does. All right, so this is me testing my web app. Notice that I didn't have to fire up Chrome or anything, right? Data, 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 data. And then I am going to format some JSON to actually have a valid token in the request. So notice my fancy good old C style formatting. I'm going to manuf manufacture a JSON string, and I'm going to pass in the verification token, which I'm going to pull out of the database. I'm going to call the event handler, and it's going to return a 200. And it took slightly longer to return a 200 than the 503. Do you know why? It is not because it took long to do the transaction or the query. It's because as I wrote it, and I could change this, as I wrote it, it also waits in line for the Slack integration. So it said, I'm going to do this query, and then I'm going to call Slack with this query and then wait for that call to come back. I didn't have to write it that way. It just did. It's fast enough. And we can see now that and there have only been five, uh, four deploy events in the last three hours. So one of the cool things about this demo is that it's completely meta. Um, I am listening on the account where this app is running. So if we deploy, we're going to get deploy events. And I was actually quite curious what was going to happen, because I'm running on solo, which means that the instance is actually down at part of the time during the Or not the instance, but the, um, the, the application. It's only down for process cycle time. Right? It's code deploy, so it's down for seconds, not minutes. But when I first wrote this, it was definitely a curiosity on my part. Like, will I get all of the um, events if I deploy this? 
So let's try that. I have. But you've got it limited to 10, right? I've got it limited to 10 in what it reports back from the query, but it also barks in the Slack channel in real time whenever one comes in as they come in. So there's two pieces of Slack integration. One is tell me about stuff that happened in the past. And, and there's a reason for me demoing both of those. If this was just about forwarding to Slack, then the value prop of Datomic is not, uh, and it's not there, right? Because you don't, you don't have a reason to also look at a database. I wanna, this is about making database-backed apps that have a hot cache that's in memory, right? This is the, the principle of Datomic. And so, um, so I made up a thing that you want to come back and ask later, which is tell me about the most recent events. You could have, obviously, Datomic has a rich query language. You could ask you know, elaborate things, and you could even allow people to pass queries in from Slack. And I'm sure people will do crazy stuff like that, and hilarity will ensue. Um, anyway, I have a couple of commands here just to give you an idea. So I'm going to do a push. Let's see, I need a place to push from. And the push commands, once you get them, once you get the push command that you need, they don't change, so I just keep them pasted. So that's the push that I'm using for development on this particular app. So I'll push. So what this is doing is it's looking at tools.deps and figuring out what my dependencies are. Uh, it's copying the things that need to be copied to S3. And then it returns the deploy command that I need to deploy it, but it doesn't tell me everything about the deploy command because I can deploy to more than one place. So the deployment um, group name is in angle brackets. You have, to, you have to pick where you want to deploy it to. Remember that this an application can be deployed to a, a variety of different atomic systems. Now in my case, and in a lot of users' cases, this will be neither here nor there because you're only going to have one system and one group and whatever. Um, but you know, one of the great things about working with Rich is he always identifies things that seem like they're cardinality one because you haven't just expanded your mind enough. And he says, no, that's cardinality many. And this is certainly an example of one. So now I've got my deploy. I'll run the deploy. And then we will wander over to AWS. And we will try to catch the deploy happening. So because the deploy has to coordinate multiple AWS services, it uses AWS step functions. We could also do this from the UI, but I like watching it because it draws these nice little pictures. Come on, internet. So this is a flow chart that changes color, green success, red fail, blue in progress. So what it's doing right now is it's looping and waiting for code deploy to say it's done. As soon as it's done with that, the second half of the flow chart is about making sure all the lambdas are right. Um, I didn't change any of the lambdas, so once it gets through here, um, it'll it'll go pretty quickly. We could oh, and it's done. Um, now the, the uncolored the white ones out there. Right? Those are branches it didn't take, um, and so some of that has to do. And you can go look at this. You can go run it yourself and take a look. Some of this has to do with Amazon doesn't have insure, so it's like I have to go. Do I have to create or do I have to update? And so it has to go down one of those branches. And because this is written in step functions, and step functions automatically generate this flowchart, you can see the guts of how it works. Of course, you could always have read the code anyway, right? So you're running all this is running in your system, so you could look at it. Um, there are other ways we could look at this. We could also have monitored the code deploy via code deploy. So we could have said, go look at code deploy and, boy, this is really slow. I'm going to wish that I, had, I'm running on the network that's upstairs instead of the one down here. Classic mistake. Um, oh, but we should go back and look at the deploys. So check it out. We got four events associated with our deploy. We got two copies of the um, success event and two copies of the start event. Um, why do we get two copies of the events? I'm not 100% sure, but I believe, and I believe that that is actually the clue, that is actually the clue to why we're getting two of each. Mm -hmm. it, starts, <laughs> it starts sending these events while the instance is not running. Because these are notifications about an instance whose process we're stopping. Um, and then it starts retrying. And then the instance is running and they get through. Now, obviously this is an advertisement for switching to the higher revenue production system <laughs> where you have, where you, have uh, you know, a, a high availability cluster. So you wouldn't see this. You would see these events come through um, in the correct order because there's always a machine up uh, to handle them. And now we can say, hello, deploy status.
and this will respond eventually, after going through several layers of plumbing, with the, again, with the most recent 10, which should now have a couple more things in it. So the important point I want to make about this, and the reason for doing the demo, was to emphasize the interactivity of development and the ordinary repleness of development. That you sit and you work with functions of data to data and you try things out. Um, and in fact, a lot of times when I was working on this, I had the second most recent version of the code already running in the cluster node and the most recent on my machine and I could test either one. I could actually invoke the code on the cluster node by using it as a user would or I could try things that I was trying to make differences with locally, you know, however I wanted to do. So the job here, um, the picture on the right of this slide is the, is the scare picture that's on the uh, IONS homepage, which is um, all the things that IONS do for you, not things you have to do. What do you do in the system? It's just this happy yellow fun part. Literally, it has FN on it. It has to be fun. And the objective of IONS is to let you do this. And when you do this, uh, you get uh, a set of advantages that we think are particular to Datomic. You get uh, automatic, architecturally sound integration with uh, auto-scaling, with high availability. Uh, you get uh, in-memory access to your data. So you get the ability to deploy functions that are going to run in-memory uh, with your database, which has always been uh, a value prop of Datomic. And uh, most importantly, you get an agile way to iteratively develop applications and deliver them on Datomic Cloud. So uh, that's the story for tonight. Uh, for more information, um, the IONS docs are linked from the presentation. I will um, drop a PDF of this presentation on Twitter. Um, when we're done here, I will turn the GitHub repository of the example public, and you can go and uh, check it out and play with it. Um, and then what I'm going to do now is uh, stop and take questions for a few minutes. And how are we going to do this with the mic? Do people need to walk to the mic, or maybe we should just, um, I can just repeat questions too. That's probably the easiest. If people speak up, that mic will pick them up. Okay, great. So, questions. Chris, were all of your questions answered? Yes, thank you. <laughs> So Chris, Chris, you know, he's, he's, he's only allowed, it's like, the, it's like the working for software in the Neil Stevens' the Cryptonomicon, do you remember that? Where they, uh, people who are working on systems are never allowed to see requirements that are more than an inch away from the part they're working on, so they have no idea how the system actually works. They're only just working on little tiny pieces of it. Do you have a Microsoft Azure version? Do we have a Microsoft Azure version? So an, an important idea here is embracing the power of actually using a cloud stack. And so, um, so we are fundamentally about how much can you get done if you embrace AWS. <clears throat> that being said, oh, we, have, we have a nice proxy for how much development effort it would take to make an Azure, Azure version of this. <clears throat> but, but in particular, we're, we are making a principal bet against cloud indirection. Right? We're making a bet against technologies that say, you know what, we're going to protect you from the differences between AWS and Azure by giving you a, a watered down thing that's not as good or as fast as either one, which becomes just as much of a thing you're married to anyway uh, over time. So we are, we are fans of individual cloud providers, not the sort of you know, spreading across cloud providers. Um, that being said, you know, um, never say never. You know, given the resources, Azure would be a really cool target. Yes? So when you're applying a transaction in an ION, do you still have the two failure modes that you have to contend with for on-premises? Uh, so the, failure timeout versus failure abort? For so, th so the question is, when you're working in uh, IONS, do you still have to contend with the failure modes um, that you have to do with on-prem? Which is, you know, you get an exception. There are some exceptions that you get back from a transaction that are clear that it failed. right? But there are other trans exceptions you can get back that are like, maybe it failed. Or maybe I just didn't find out what happened, and then you have to go back and check. That is unchanged. Uh, we do have, obviously, there are ways to build into the programming model how to deal with that. And we um, have had some design discussions about item potency of transactions and things like that. Uh, but as of now, the, the underlying semantics at that level of transactions are really quite the same 
as in Datomic on-prem. And it really is the same underlying engine for transactions and query. Right? The differences are at the edges and in operational characteristics and in ease of getting started, which is probably the, by far the biggest difference. When you're writing a um, API gateway um, function, do you typically set it up as uh, one API gateway per endpoint, or um, you just pass all the requests through and let the, the handler at the other end figure out how to route them? So Jacob's question has to do with the cardinality of the relationship between API gateway endpoints and, um, and ions. And the answer is, it depends. Uh, you, know, you can make um, you know, cases for either one. Amazon has some recommendations. I think we'll see people um, trying both. The thing that I have been doing um, primarily is having a single app. But you can imagine scenarios where you want, I mean, when you find some configuration on the gateway side that you want to vary, you may end up want to have, wanting to have more than one. Of course, more than one could still all point to the same lambda, or they could point to different lambdas. Right? All the, all the axes are open to you to making those choices. But there, is a, there would always be a one-to-one -one mapping between a lambda and a function. There is always, yes, there is a one-to-one -one mapping between a lambda and a function. Well, no, that's not true either. I take that back. You could have 10 lambdas that all targeted the same function. Why not? What? A lambda can't be routed to more than one function. That's what I thought you were saying. And then yes. I thought about your sentence, and I don't think that's what your words actually said. So, but, but to go back. It's, it, it is a, a, function, a function is a one-to-one -one relationship to a, uh, excuse me, a lambda has a one-to-one -one relation, one -one relationship with a function, but functions can have a one-to-many relationship with lambdas. OK. You yes. Can multiple, you can yes, multiple, you could have multiple lambdas. And let's, and let's make this concrete for people by looking at yeah. the ion config. You could have in here 10 different named lambdas, all of whom said their function was the same closure function, which is what you just said. Yeah. Yes, that is right. Uh, so what if uh, someone wanted all the advantages of the atomic ions, like the scalability and like this great story for creating lambdas and whatnot, um, but then they were like, but I feel like making a bad decision. And so if Datomic, I want to use like Mongo or something like that, <laughs> would, it, would, it, would it make sense? Is it possible? Uh, and would it make sense? So, so hypothetical future realities that we've talked about, um, realities that are realities of what you do with Datomic, like the things that people might do. Um, I mean, uh, ions are a pretty kick-ass way to deploy closure apps, regardless of whether they use Datomic. I could entirely imagine a Mongo-backed closure app that used ions for deployment to get access to these other capabilities, or used Datomic as a configuration store, or as, an, as a store for you know, operational data or something else that was not about the primary function of the application. There's nothing about this. right? I mean, one way to think about this is uh, uh, a, a really powerful operational deployment strategy that includes a free database. <laughs> <laughs> that, memory database. A free, well, a free what? In memory database? Well, I don't want to call it an in memory database because then people will think it only fits in memory. So, a free database that you have in memory access to all the data, but that can expand to data that's larger than fits in memory. Okay. So, in memory is one of those things that's kind of too overloaded, right? But yeah, I could totally imagine a scenario where somebody used uh, Datomic Cloud just to deploy a closure application just to get access to some of the other bits. And I think that will become more the case as we continue to roll out integrations. Certainly, um, you know, the Lambda integration and the API gateway integration are the first two, but those are just a taste. And the idea is, you know, if, if, a, if AWS makes connective tissue, we want to let you write closure functions. That's, that's you know, and, and it really comes back to, I want to write, I want to a programmer, I want to, I want to, figure out the solution to business problems and implement those solutions in code. And I completely accept that all of the concerns around operationalizing that are my problem. Right? They are. Uh, but I would love to have tools that let me spend as much time as possible in the former headspace. Right? I'm devising um, information solutions to business problems. And letting the heavy lifting of making the operational things solid happen somewhere else. And of course, here, that somewhere else is in your AWS account. So another important proposition here is that you can use this how you see fit. 
So a lot of times people will ask questions like, well, what if I wanted to add a role to the instances and have them also do this? We're like, you know, well, they're your instances, right? They're your EC2 instances running in a cloud formation template behind an ASG, all of which are controlled in your account. Um, now, if you change the configuration, I mean, if you add stuff to do stuff you want, that's cool. If you change the configuration, we can't support you, right? If you go and say, well, you know, I turned off the load balancer and I, I closed these network ports and I don't understand why it doesn't work anymore, right? We can't help you with that. But if you want to add things to it or have it do things we didn't anticipate, that's certainly the, the dream is that you'll come up with cool things that we didn't anticipate. Yes? Do the EC2 compute instances that actually run this code, can they be locked down so they can't connect to the internet? Or are there certain things in the internet that it just, they need? Like, they so the question is, can, how, how can these EC2 instances be locked down? Um, they're already running in a private VPC. And they can be locked down in terms of how they go out to the internet. And Chris, you might want to speak to this a little bit. I mean, some of that has to do with make, making VPC endpoints for DynamoDB and S3. Right, yeah. So we, we have endpoints for, for Dynamo and S3. Uh, things like Maven, though, uh, you need to get to the internet to get to Maven. So although we don't, I mean, if you don't care about Maven, then you can turn that off. Um, but we don't, I mean, we don't need to get to the internet to get to Maven anymore because we, so that's another benefit of the tools depths deploy. It actually copies all the Maven stuff into an S3 bucket. So you need to be able to get to that S3 bucket. You don't have to actually get to Maven anymore. But there are going to be, I mean, so I, I think it becomes nuanced. But our, our objective there is to do whatever security best practice AWS makes possible. And they certainly have thought about some of these things, right? The fact that you can have these private VPC endpoints to access DynamoDB and things like that. And we do them where they're available. So if it's AWSable, we can do it. When the, the Atomic team decides, hey, you like, OK, you use the first version of this, but we really think you should um, configure your IAM groups slightly differently. What's the upgrade plan? So the upgrade plan is um, when you look at the uh, release notes on the Datomic Cloud page, you'll see that Datomic Cloud is already broken into two templates, the storage template and the compute template. And there will be additional compute templates uh, in the future. Um, uh, we are very serious about breakage, and we make changes non-breaking for people where it's possible, and we plan ahead to not get into situations where that doesn't happen. And um, I mean, I, I'll offer a couple of technical points. I mean, the fact that we've split these templates is already to facilitate. We can make changes to the compute that are not going to affect changes to storage, and you don't have to upgrade both. Um, it is our objective to have upgrades um, always be compatible and rolling, um, and you know we will succeed at that or we won't. Uh, but it's important to us, and I think that you know if you want to get a sense of how important thinking about breaking changes to us, I think you'd look you should look at Rich's sensibilities in guiding closure and say you can expect Atomic to be um, guided along a similar sort of passion for not breaking people. And I'm not you know we're so I mean the things that you know. There's nothing lurking out there that we think is, you know, trivially breaking that's coming, right? That's not. Um, so I don't anticipate a lot of that happening. Um, with on-prem, we had breaking changes maybe three times in five years, where where people had to. Well, and I should say by breaking, what I mean in that case is situations where people had to have a system down to in, to bridge the gap. Um, um, those were often imposed on us by tools that we depended on having. Uh, mandatory and downtime inducing changes. Um, and of course, that could happen to us with Amazon, right? Amazon could have a change that says, you know, we're going to change the way these things work. So it's not completely in our hands, but I think that we have, um, uh, I think we have a good reputation for paying attention to this and trying to be on top of it. Yes? Uh, are there uh, any types of uh, cloud applications for uh, which Ion, with, you know, its various decisions made, you know, opinionated bits is not suitable? Are there kinds of applications for which Datomic uh, ions and cloud are not suitable? Certainly all the things for which Datomic on-prem was never suitable, right? It's not a media store. It's not a blob store. It's not a churn store, right? It makes no sense to have a web page hit counter with history, right? I know what the number was before it was a million. It was 999,999. And I know what it was before that. So there's a whole, there's a whole set of things for which Datomic Cloud is not suitable. Um, I would say that there's one big additional 
factor with cloud, and that is, do you want to be on AWS? Right? If you want to be on AWS, Datomic Cloud is hands down better than Datomic On-Prem for the things it's good at. And if you are allergic to being on AWS, then Datomic Cloud is going to be of no interest to you. So that, that's, a, that's a big difference. But I think in terms of the underlying semantics, uh, not a lot. Not a lot different because, again, the core engines are the same. Right? The transaction engine, the query engine, data log, all those things are the same. I have no idea how long we've been here. That's not too bad. Another hour of questions then. Yes? So how do you ensure that your ions don't use JVM or closure resources in such a way that the Datomic process itself is, is interrupted? Like, can you chew up all the core async and go threads? Yes. You so you get happy, obviously, but you just say, don't do that, because that would hurt. <laughs> so, so let me tell you the story of Jarrett, the support engineer. Mm -hmm. and. He's not allowed to speak, so I will tell a story for him. He can just howl in pain if he disagrees at some point. Uh, so once upon a time, there was Datomic on-prem. And um, the vast majority of the challenging support issues had to do with things that people did at the edge that were not really about Datomic. Right? It was, I configured Cassandra wrong, and sadness ensued. But there was a symptom in Datomic, so I called Datomic support. Um, a lot of it had to do with managing storage. Right? Because these storages have a ton of knobs on them, and people like to turn the knobs and see what happens. And my experience in support is people really love turning the knobs like a half dozen times, not keeping a written record of what turns they made, and then calling you and saying, I don't really know why this is not working. So in Datomic on-prem, I would say that the messing up configuration knobs that were about deploying the whole thing dominated, I made stuff that chewed up memory, and I was sad or I made stuff that chewed up CPU and I was said We have both of those kinds of support issues, right? Definitely people do things that are like, um, we, had a, we had a great um, support issue from a customer that was keeping track of, of money using arbitrary precision integers and never rounding. And so they got to the point where every like, dollar value had you know, 8,000 significant digits that they were keeping and it was causing performance problems. They didn't know that they had done it. And so, but you know, all kinds of like, you know, crazy things can happen. Uh, so, so, on prim so, so when we said, hey, we're going to build Datomic Cloud so that a lot of the operational knobs that you could burn your fingers with, you don't have to worry about anymore, Jarrett cheered wildly. He was, he was very happy. And in fact, of the various places where people deployed Datomic, uh, on AWS and using Dynamo was probably the least support causing. Right? It was everybody who's running it on-prem would tend to have all the weird and bizarre issues. So just being on the cloud made things better, and then automating the cloud more made things better still. Now, fast forward to IONS. We had to talk about IONS really fast in the first couple of meetings that we had about them, so Jarrett wouldn't cotton on to the fact that we were now reintroducing the problem that you just described, <laughs> which is he's going to get support calls from, from you know, people saying, you know, my system's down, and it keeps running out of memory. And he's going to say, well, you did something that used up all the memory. And the customer is going to say, well, what did I do? <laughs> and so yeah, it's good. That's, you know, they're your instances. So it's a benefit and a curse. And um, I think the power is worth it. And the value prop is high. Um, obviously, if that's like your biggest concern, you don't have to use it. Right? You could continue to run. You could use the Lambda integration and all that stuff and not write um, you know, very heavyweight stuff if you wanted to. I mean, there's, you, you, have, you have choices about how to manage that. But yes, um, they're your processes, and you can you know, create things that sit in a hot loop. And instead of heating up your data center rack, you'll heat up Amazon's data center rack when you do. All right. Thank you.